Hey everybody. So today I was in Max Discord and somebody uh, came up with a question that I thought made an interesting topic for a video. So that person is Valdgeist here in Max Discord and they said, is anyone aware of an LFO device that lets me specify the probability of the values it's going to output? What if I want a random LFO that sits between 30% and 50% for 80% of its cycle? Haven't found anything so far. So I understand this to be a kind of random number generator that looks a little bit like this, right? Where we have this kind of bell curve shape distribution. And the one place that I know that I've seen something like this is inside of the Kaivo um, synth from Madrona Labs, where there's a really cool noise generator where you can create this kind of normal distribution shape and generate noise kind of within that range. Um, so I thought that it would be fun to try to make this in Max, or at least something approximating it, which could be a really useful modulation source for you to use within Max or within Max for Live. So let's see how I went ahead and did this. And I'd love to hear from you if you have any other ideas about ways to make this uh, better in terms of perhaps modifying the algorithm or um, thinking about kind of what are some creative ways for this algorithm to be controlled. Because um, I think that's one of the Kind of the most interesting questions here is how does a person actually interact and control this shape, basically, so that they can get the type of results that they're looking for. So the idea here is actually quite simple. Basically, all I'm doing is just using a uh, phaser and a what to give ourselves a stream of pulses. And every time we get one of those pulses, we use a sample and hold to sample a noise signal. And in fact, two of them. So one on the left, one on the right here. Then we take the first one and we give it some range. So I'm using our slider object here to transform the noise's natural range of negative one to one to 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. And then we're taking that difference between the bottom of the range and the top of the range multiplying it by some coefficient, in this case just one, so it stays 0 0.2, and uh, using another scale to give ourselves that range around zero, so negative one, 0 0.1 to 0 0.1. So in here, that's all we're doing is we're just taking the length of the first range and the coefficient and multiplying that by 0 0.5, and then taking just that number and also that number times negative one, so the negative version of that number, and sending it on into um, the scale here. And then we just add those two things together. And so I've noticed that when we're using this coefficient that's kind of close to one, we get this really nice uh, sort of rounded kind of bell curve-ish shape. If we increase this, or let's say actually decrease it, so let's make it zero, we're going to end up getting way more of like a square shape. So when I when I um, hit this zero, we're actually going to refresh kind of the plot down here, and I'll show you actually a little bit about how it's done because it's kind of cool, and see what the new shape looks like. So you can see the general range is roughly the same in here, but we're already seeing that the distribution is far more kind of square, meaning it's generally going to be as high on the sides as it is in the middle, although the middle does seem to be taking off right now. So let's see, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Because basically on this side, we're just not adding anything. Although <laughs> it appears that we are, so what's going on here? Got lots of windows open. Okay. Looks like I have a mistake here. Zero. Oh, <laughs> it's because I have this in here. Zero. There we go. So now we should see that be far more square. Let's see how it goes. And I'm going to turn up the speed here to 100. There we go. So very, very square. If I go back to one and we build it again, we're getting this kind of 
more bell curvy shape. If I do, if I go start to move away, so like, I think one is going to kind of give us the the most kind of slopey result that we can possibly get, right? If we wanted to make like the overall distance between here and here wider, then we would do it here. And this one is kind of interesting in that it it affects the width, but it also really affects the slopiness. And as you move away from one, you get kind of a flatter midsection. So if I made this, let's say three, and I'm actually gonna adjust this so that it's kind of more, it's very narrow and it's in the middle. We're still gonna have the slopey sides, but it should generally be flatter in the middle, I believe, as it kind of works its way out. So that's why I said in the beginning of the video, I think one of the interesting challenges with this algorithm is to kind of figure out what's a really good way to control it because we have this parameter controlling both the slopiness and the width. This one's controlling, you know, the, the starting point and the width. Um, and maybe that's actually two great ways to do it, but it'd be, I think there's lots of other ways to think about how do we actually design? Like you could think about, you know, this base width being something that you control. There's lots of options. So while this is going, let me just conclude here by showing you the plot. Um, and by the way, we're taking, so we're adding those two together and then we're just clipping them to the range of negative one to one, which is kind of typical for uh, a modulation source. So now if we look at this plot, so this is the plot object, plot tilde, uh, which is really cool object. If you look at the help file, there's a lot of pretty interesting information about things that you can do with it. Like you can display the contents of a buffer, so you can actually show a waveform, which is really cool. Um, you can kind of make like a chart like this, and it's really great for kind of showing distributions like this. So the way that I've done this is we have up here a section that just uh, uses snapshots. So anytime the value to the input changes, which you know what, to be honest with you, is not uh, not strictly correct. What we should really be doing is just banging it anytime we get a new number at all, because you could get the same number twice. So let's actually do that. So I have a type root here already, and I'm going to make it so that this uh, what objects second outlet, which is just going to give us like a an index. I'm just going to convert that to a bang. And then we can use the outlet of the type root for bang here and bang our snapshot. And then I'm going to get rid of this. So now we know that every time there's a pulse from this phaser, uh, or from the what object rather, that's triggering the sample and hold, we're gonna get a bang into type route. And then, so we're getting this stream of floating point numbers. Let me slow this down again. And each time we get one, we turn it into an integer and we send it into the histo object, which basically just keeps track. It builds a histogram. It keeps track of how many times it is seen um, each number. So I basically started off with this argument to say, hey, there's going to be 200 possible numbers. And anytime I give you one of those numbers, you're going to just store internally how many times since you've been cleared have you seen that. And what it outputs for us is uh, something from the left and the right inlets. And those basically are, let me slow this down even more to like two. Those are uh, the number and the number of times it's seen that number. What we can then do is uh, put that into an array. So I have an array that's 200 items long and I create that just by initializing it when the patch loads. So we have a load bang. And in fact, anytime you send the clear message into this abstraction, I'm sorry, not abstraction, sub patcher, uh, we're going to just update this array 
uh, we'll clear it and then we'll add 200 zeros to it. And then each time we get one of these, we put data in the histogram, it tells us how many times that particular number has appeared in the data set. It will send this message like replace, you know, replace, oops. Replace the number at this position, so whatever the first number is, with the value at the second position. And then we have an array that will look something like this. If I send the Adams message here, and actually we don't want this. So Adams is a way to tell uh, array arrays in Max to just output their contents as a list. So now we have for all 200 possible values, and we've we've had to use integers here, right? Because histo and this plot, they kind of want like a set number of options. So on this negative one-to-one -one range, we're just using 200 options. And it's basically telling us here, you know, for each possible number from zero to 200, how many of each of those have existed. Uh, we then stick that into a dictionary which there's a bunch of different ways to talk to the plot object and tell it to kind of update itself. Um, but one of the really handy ways is just to use a dictionary that kind of describes the dictionary. So what's the data? And then also a bunch of information related to the styling. So I kind of have just a bunch of defaults here that say, um, you know, what's the, what's the style of the points what do the lines look like? What color are they? How thick are they? Things like that. And if you want to learn more about how that works in the plot object, you can check out the, um, the help file where we have a dictionary tab in this example where I can say get dictionary. What it then did was from here, it output the dictionaries actually for two plots because there's two separate charts here. And then if I double click this, I can see the whole dictionary for the first one. And then you can send one of these dictionaries back into the object to update it. So you could like take this and then modify it however you wanted to. You could change some data. You could also change the styling and send it back around. So this object is really, really useful if you're trying to display data. Um, and I've even kind of built you know UIs and things like that with uh, this object. All right, so that's it for today. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Let me know if you know, let me know if you have any ideas about ways to improve or modify this algorithm or improve the UI. I'm really interested to hear what you all think. Maybe someday this is actually a cool thing to make a kind of Swiss Army knife LFO out of. I've never seen a modulation source like this in live and I think that people would probably uh, enjoy using something like this. So thanks, see you next time.